So two weeks ago, I had the honor of participating in the Double Line Roundtable Prime as a panelist where we discussed and debated the, the fate of the economy, the markets, uh, just a whole array of things. Why the experts, of course, keep getting it wrong and the intersection of Federal Reserve policy during a presidential election year. Now, of course, we know a lot has changed in the economy and markets post-2020. And now many are wondering if we're actually in a new paradigm shift or maybe just old patterns have been altered uh, under circumstances like uh, the pandemic, the avalanche of money into this economy, and a Federal Reserve that seems to be trying to rewrite its own playbook. Now, remember, Double Line is, uh, is just an amazing firm founded in 2009 by Jeffrey Gunlock, also, of course, known as the Bond King on Wall Street because of his frustration with the industry at the time, currently managing $93 billion on the management. I would like to bring in now founder, CEO, Jeffrey Gunlock. Jeff, thank you so much for coming on. And again, I want to thank you for inviting me to that roundtable. I absolutely loved it. Uh, I learned more. I learned so much every time I go, and I appreciate it. I want to begin with you and the audience with, a big, with the big picture. Wall Street has bought a hook, line, and sinker into the notion of a soft landing for the economy. It's reflected in the stock market to the, and the bond market. Your thoughts? Well, first of all, Charles, uh, thanks for doing the Roundtable Prime, which is up on DoubleLine.com. I mean, you just absolutely crushed it. I thought that was terrific. Um, what, what's going on here is ever since November 1st, with the Fed getting very, very dubbish, uh, unequivocally, in the press conference and in the, in the statements, we've seen a very strong rally in just about everything. Um, and that's caused by about a 100 basis point rally in bonds. We had real interest rates rising rel relentlessly for much of last year, and that reversed uh, when the Fed did that pivot. So rates are down a lot. But one thing that I think I can uh, help the, the, the audience with is for a while, it was all blue chip assets that were going up in uh, November and December. It was Treasury bonds. It was S&P 500. But if you looked underneath the surface in the fixed income market, what you saw was that the middle part of the market was not participating. What I mean by that is not AAA securities, not treasuries. I'm talking about AA, single A, triple B types of securities, particularly those that are uh, securitized. So say commercial real estate backed securities, asset backed securities tied to the consumer. There was still a lot of skepticism about that part of the market. And a lot of investors don't pay attention to that. It really is a very important thing to watch. And that, those sectors have absolutely uh, shrugged off all of the fears that were holding them back, say, in November and December, and are now really almost priced for perfection. Uh, let me talk about the commercial real estate securities market. We had a big meeting about that uh, yesterday, and we we're talking about how the fundamentals since November in the commercial, particularly the office market, but commercial real estate market, have not improved. If you look at it very carefully, they've actually gotten modestly worse. And yet the securities have gone up massively in price. Uh, Treasury yields are up a little bit this year, about 25 basis points. But the yields on, say, AA commercial mortgage-backed securities have, have gone down by 150 basis points. We bought some securities around the time of Roundtable Prime that were single-A rated in, the, in that market. And they're up about six points in the last couple of weeks, which is a huge catch-up. What I'm getting to here, Charles, is there seems to be a grabby nature to the market, which advises caution no matter what you think about the so-called soft landing uh, in, in the economy. Um, so uh, we think this is time to be upgrading portfolios uh, and selling some of these assets because there's liquidity now that didn't exist for much of 2023. And so in a broad sense, because this is kind of a picky picayune thing that I'm talking about, in a broad sense, I think the markets are in a euphoria type of a period right, right now. <clears throat> and know, I, I worry about that. No, no, I was going to say uh, to that point, I did a, a segment a couple of weeks ago. I got cute, tried to get cute about the canary in the coal mine. And does the canary ever get, can the canary actually, you know, uh, be too exuberant? And it sounds like, yeah, you know, if we can't depend on the bond market to, to be, uh, keep a steady hand that maybe there is too much exuberance out there. But, you know, one of the reasons I think for that, Jeff, is, uh, think about the yield curve inversion, right? It's been a long time. Uh, and there have been some other things like leading economic indicators. It's been a long time since they've been negative. And the promise was that those were reliable 
uh, indicators, proxies for impending recessions. So the longer you have that we don't have a recession, more, the more confident everyone gets that we're not going to have one. And then it feels like, you know, uh, you know Katie barred a door because the last person in is going to miss out. Yes, well, the yield curve has been inverted now uh, for about 80 weeks, maybe a little more than 80 weeks, which is, I'm talking about twos to tens, and you can look at almost all comparisons. They've been inverted for about that time period. The only uh, uh, episode that had a longer period of an inverted yield curve before the recession came was in the late 70s, early 80s, which interestingly was also the last time we had an inflation fight going on, although that one was uh, much more difficult than this one appears to be. So I, I, I think, though, that the thing on the yield curve that's important is the twos tens was negative 108 basis points. The 10-year yield was lower than the two-year yield by 108 basis points, and now it's 18. And when you start to de-invert, you really get to be on recession watch. Mm -hmm. And the fact that recession hasn't come after 80-plus weeks of yield curve inversion is a very bad logic to say it's not coming, because the de-inversion is happening. When it comes to uh, leading economic indicators, They've fallen for 21 consecutive months. But the thing that's wrong about uh, historical comparisons, or misleading perhaps, about historical comparisons, is this economy has been very strange in that manufacturing was very strong in 2021, 2022, with all that stimulus that came in. And it went to a lot of uh, durable goods you know, uh, type of prop products. And the leading economic indicators are skewed towards manufacturing. So it's not surprising that they've been weak for a long time because they're very manufacturing oriented and manufacturing is very weak. But the economy handed off the GDP, if you will, to the services sector starting about 18 months ago. And, and that uh, has skewed a lot of these economic indicators. So the leading economic indicators have been very negative for a long time. The yield curve has been inverted for a long time. But the thing that I'm most concerned about now economically is reports coming from the states. We look at right. national unemployment data, and we, you, I saw, heard in the previous segment talking about that. I thought it was a good conversation. But the states release unemployment data, too. And amazingly, 88% of the states, and I think they have D.C. in there, so there's 51 of them, 88% of them are reporting rising unemployment over the last six months. And I'm having a very hard time squaring this circle. Mm. If 88% of the states are reporting rising unemployment, how can it be that national unemployment remains stable at a very, very low level? Right. Um, I guess the only logic would be that the other 12% of the states are making up for all of that rising unemployment, which is kind of hard to believe, because those states, while it includes Texas, and I think includes Pennsylvania, it also includes North Dakota and Wyoming. It's hard for me to believe that this set of states can offset rising unemployment in Florida, Illinois, uh, yeah. California, yeah. New York. Yeah. And, and so I'm, I'm skeptical about this data. Um, and, and so I, I, I noticed that in the JOLTS survey, that job openings thing that was getting a lot of play because it was so elevated, uh, the percentage of, res of surveyors responding to the survey uh, used to be 75%. And now it's down, I'm talking about maybe five years ago, and now it's down to 35%. So what is going on here yeah. that suddenly 35% responding? I, I wonder if the survey data is really comparable to past periods. There's no so, doubt. So I don't know. I, 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 go ahead. No, I was just going to say there, there's no doubt that we should, there's, there's a lot less uh, reliable, they feel a lot less reliable. By the way, I was going to say also with the states, uh, the so-called SOM rule, uh, the speed of which some of these states are losing uh, jobs or the unemployment rate, 20 are technically in recession already. Jeffrey, if you can, I want you to stick around. We've got to take a quick break. When we come back, uh, you know, I want to, I want to talk about, uh, we talked about the dangerous spots, but also want to talk about investment opportunities, where investors should be thinking about moving. We'll be right back with the Bond King. All right, folks, welcome back. And remember, carve out some time. You really do want to watch this. Double Line Round Tree. Uh, and you go to DoubleLine.com. It is really worth it. It is at, it's just a magnificent event. And, and trust me, anyone serious about investing in this market, uh, you should take out the time. Meanwhile, Jeff, Jeffrey Gunlock is back with us. And, you know, Jeff, I want to start with Jay Powell um, because, let's face it, that, Octo that late October pivot, you, you alluded to it, uh, the sort of uh, when we're going to do three rate cuts instead of two. Call it a victory lap. How concerned are you, though, that maybe he's becoming like Captain Ahab chasing this soft landing? 
I think what Jay Powell is doing is he realizes a couple of things. First of all, real rates are pretty high. If you look at the inflation rate, which people have chosen to start parsing things like three and six months annualized and excluding things uh, from various indices, but nonetheless, the inflation rate is clearly falling. And it's going to fall further, we believe, absent something like an oil shock. And so I think Jay Powell is thinking about not so much a soft landing, but that he needs rates to come down on a real basis mm. because the inflation rate is coming down. Also, we have this problem with interest expense. We have now about a trillion dollars per year of interest expense, which is about 15 percent of GDP, and it's headed higher if rates stay where they are. The average Treasury yield rate is about 3.2. And there are no three handles out there in the bond market. So every bond that matures is going to have, uh, is likely to push that higher. All of the uh, five year treasuries that were issued in 2019 are coming due this year. Those had yields of like 50 basis points. And they're going to be refinanced, reissued at yields as of today above 4%. This would put the, push the interest expense much higher. And this is a really fundamental problem. We need to get our interest expense down. And if the inflation rate is relaxing, there, that, that's a good way to do it. So that, that's, that's how I'm thinking about things relative to Jay Powell. I do expect they're going to cut rates. I'm not really of, strongly of the opinion, as most people are, that's all political. I think there's, it, it lurks in the background, you know, the fact that it's a presidential election year. But I really think it's about about where the economy is, which mm -hmm. is in a stable place for now, but where the real interest rates are. So I think investors should buy th two, three, five-year treasuries because you're locking in a, a rate which isn't uh, you know, towering, but it's above the inflation rate, which continues to fall. And I think those rates on the shortest end, the old T-bill and chill strategy, which I never really recommended because I think the Fed's going to cut. So if you want to buy a five and a quarter, a six-month bill, you'll be happy for six months. But there's a strong chance you might roll that over at a level that's below today's uh, three and five year treasuries. So that, that's what I kind of like in fixed income. Mm -hmm. I'm less fond uh, in the prior segment. I talked about these big rallies in uh, junk bonds and in the even lower uh, tier investment grade bonds, which really seem extended. I prefer treasury bonds there. Now, when it comes to the equity market, we talked about the round table. I like Japan. I like uh, India, and I like these as long-term plays. We're in a, in a valuation spot in the equity market where I think you start, have to start looking long-term and sort of try to skip this last phase of the uh, exuberation, uh, exuberance game, because I think the value is very, very high. And it bothers me that the leader, the Magnificent Seven, has really stopped being a leader in the upside. It's, it's participating, but it peaked out on a relative strength basis back in July. And so I'm suspicious of the valuations and I'm suspicious of the exuberance right. in the market. So I want to have cash at this point, which I want to deploy, maybe even 25% cash, which I might want to deploy in, in, in the aftermath of the recession that is going to come. Yes, it's been delayed. Yes, the M2 economists that are geared towards money supply have been uh, particularly wrong because M2, in spite of the fact that it's negative year over year, which is often historically a recession, recession sign, it's still at a very high level. And I've looked at the trend line of M2 prior pandemic and to where we are today, we're still above the M2 growth trend line that was in place pre-pandemic. Right. And it might stay in place that way uh, for another year or so. But I think look, investors should be well, looking long term and looking to hold cash and buy emerging markets, which are doing very badly and will continue to do badly as we enter recession. So stay away for now, but buy them once they're substantially right. cheaper. You'll notice that China is doing very badly and that's right, bleeding so over we've got emer uh, into emerging markets broadly. We've got emerging markets, particularly India, Japan, maybe China. Uh, hold on to cash and, and T-bill and chill, something that you normally don't do. But in this environment, I love the fact that you're getting people prepared for what may be down the road instead of being so myopic because this market, and believe me, it's the experts more than anyone else have become so fixated on chasing performance, I think it's going to hurt them and a whole lot of people. Jeff, it has been an absolute honor. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Charles. Good luck with 2024. You too, buddy.